that uh, get that working. Once again, we'll turn turn the time over to Elliot Lawrence. It'll come up and say that Doug Folsom is uh, is speaking. It's actually Elliot there. It's just how we signed in today. Elliot. Great. Well, thank you uh, for uh, having us. And um, our presentation course today is uh, all about exactions. And so uh, I'm sure you're all excited about uh, learning about this. And uh, this is a topic that's near and dear to, uh, well, my heart and all of us at the Office of the Property Rights Ombudsman, because that's a, a large part of what we do. Um, and it is actually a very important topic. Uh, it is fairly straightforward, so it's actually fairly easy to for everyone to at least can understand the basics of it. And um, so our objectives today, first of all, we want to learn about uh, what an exaction is uh, and who can uh, who can impose an exaction or who gets to who gets to exact, I guess, the question. And we need to go the other way. Must have hit the wrong button. Go backwards and forwards over here too. And uh, we'll also touch on some of the statutes and the cases that are important for, uh, on the exaction law. Uh, we have a lot. Of, <clears throat> there's um, statutes for cities, for counties, and uh, these are derived from the Nolan and Dolan case of the Supreme Court. And uh, what that comes down to is you have an essential link and the exaction has to be proportionate in nature and proportionate in extent. And then uh, hopefully if time permits, we can move on to some other issues and these are uh, exactions from other entities. And what I mean by that is uh, entities that are not uh, approving the development. And uh, there's some special rules for water exactions and uh, We'll talk about uh, what happens when it goes wrong. If we have to return the exaction or if there are other remedies. And then uh, time permitting, we can touch briefly on impact fees. Impact fees are a type of exaction, so we need to uh, include that. So the first question, what is an exaction? And it is a contribution of property that is required as a condition of development approval. Um, for example, in a uh, take a picture, I took a picture of a bike path. Uh, I don't believe that was uh, exacted. That was actually uh, close, it's actually in front of our office in downtown Salt Lake, but that's just a type of an example. Um, <clears throat> that uh, property is uh, dedicated, uh, property is dedicated for uh, a bike path or for uh, expanding a road. And so an exaction can include land, in construction, it can also be payment of money and, like I said, impact fees. Um, the money, uh, just a special case, there was a uh, Supreme Court case from last year. It's called, uh, it's from Florida, Kuntz for St. John's uh, River Water Conservancy District. Um, and one of the exactions that was at issue was uh, this conservancy district asked for basically a contribution of money and it was to build uh, some, or to, to improve some wetlands, make some wetland improvements. And uh, they made the argument that, well, it was, it's just money. It's not a contribution of land. And uh, the Supreme Court said, no, an exaction is an exaction. And it, and it can be money uh, as well as land. Uh, so just uh, to remember that in the future. Um, exactions are a type of taking. And as such, they are governed by the takings clause of the Constitution, uh, the federal Constitution, and also our state Constitution. Uh, in Utah, we have uh, the equivalent language is that but private property uh, shall not be taken or damaged for a public use without compensation. And so, uh, although exactions are, uh, they derive from the takings laws or an authority, government's authority to take property, they're a little bit different. Um, ordinarily, when we think of a taking, we think a, a government basically acquires some property and for a public use. Uh, for example, just the other day, I spoke with a, a gentleman, they're, they're building a new road. This is in Utah County. Uh, they're installing a new road or building a new road, and 
they are acquiring a portion of his property for this road. And in that case, the government, the government can, they can acquire this property for the road as long as they pay this property owner. So it's an either or. Uh, either the government pays for the property or it doesn't get to take it. Exactions are a little bit different because exactions, uh, the government is only obligated to pay for the excess. And as we'll see as we get into the analysis, uh, uh, an exaction is basically that the new development should pay its fair share. And anything above that fair share is a taking. And so either it can't be done or it needs to be compensated. Um, and also, we'll move on. Here we are. Who gets to, uh, sorry, who gets to exact? So it's local governments, uh, that cities, counties, and uh, local districts. Um, local districts, by the way, does not include school districts, but it includes the um, uh, well, water conservancy districts, for example, uh, fire districts, some other types of things. Probably the one that's most, uh, that would be most affecting development would be water districts. I was looking at the list and I wanted to see if Rachel White was on the list. She's from, uh, if she's joined in, uh, she's from West Valley City. Uh, I, I don't see pick, her on the list. Uh, well, too bad. I was going to pick on her. Uh, but um, West Valley City, for example, uh, even though it's a very large city, uh, it does not have a water department because the water service in West Valley is provided by uh, special service districts. Um, and the special service districts, uh, they can impose exactions uh, uh, in the same way that the city could. Uh, another part of the exaction, however, it is only available for new development and can only be imposed at the time of approval. That's actually a LUDMA rule that uh, any requirement on development has to be expressed or imposed at the time of approval. You can't come uh, afterwards. Uh, for example, if a subdivision has been approved, um, you can't come up later and say, oh, by the way, we need you to do, you know, do this. That has to be uh, the exaction, along with any other requirement, has to be expressed at the time of approval. Um, and then the other, which is also very important, um, exactions can only be imposed on new development. Uh, so if, if the development application, if what they're doing is replacing old development, then you can't impose an exaction because the exaction is based on the uh, the, the burden that the increased burden on public services. And so that only happens when there's new development, not when there's replacement development. Uh, there was a case recently, um, this is actually, it was out of California, but it illustrates this principle. Uh, there was a, the developer had bought, it was in a, an apartment complex and an old, an old building, which they proposed to tear down the old apartment complex and build a new one. And the new one would be larger. It would have it would have more units. Um, and uh, this this city, they imposed impact fees or exactions um, on it was on the on one it was the exactions were for each unit. And so this new development came in and said, oh, we're going to build this many uh, units from our apartment complex. And they said, well, okay, that's the impact fee is per unit. And um, the developer made the argument, said, wait a minute, um, we're replacing uh, some of these units. I think it was about half. Uh, so half of the units are replacement of this previous apartment complex. And uh, this went to the, um, it was the California uh, appellate courts, and uh, they agreed. They said, look, you can only impose the exaction on the new, the new portion. So in other words, the, the units that were over and above the, uh, the that older complex, that was okay, but the replacement units, uh, you couldn't impose an exaction or impact fees on that. So, exactions started uh, back in 1987 with Nolan. Uh, this is Nolan versus California Coastal Commission, Supreme Court case from 1987. 
And this was the beginning of what we know and love as the Nolan Dolan test. Uh, the second case was from 1994, was Dolan versus the city of Tiger in Oregon. And uh, what the summary is, the nutshell is, each exaction must meet the rough proportionality analysis. If it does not, the exaction uh, is not valid and it is actually a taking. And what rough proportionality does is it compares the exaction, what is being asked uh, of the developer, against the impact that is caused by the development. And uh, should be something coming up. It's not. There we are. Yeah, see, it was developed by the Nolan Nolan decision, for those of you following along. So what is the impact? When this is a, a, an important concept uh, in uh, when we talk about exactions, a lot of times uh, we sort of overlook this part. Uh, the impact is the increased need for public services uh, that is caused by the development. And these are the roads, the fire department, the police department, um, water and sewer, and then also parks. Um, these are the, the type of things that uh, can be, you can require a, de a dedication of land as part of an exaction. Um, you may recognize that these are also the same things that we can charge impact fees for. And that's pretty much pretty close to the, the same, uh, same things. Um, so now we have the rough proportionality. Um, and this language that is on the screen is a uh, pretty much a, a direct quote from the statutes that govern, that provide the exaction or govern exactions. And again, they are taken directly. Uh, the language is almost a, an exact quote from the Nolan and Dolan decisions of the Supreme Court. Um, first of all, there has to be an essential link uh, between a legitimate government interest and the exaction. And secondly, the, each exaction must be roughly proportionate in nature and extent to the impact of the development. Um, and just to pause right there, and when it says each exaction, that means each and every exaction has to stand on its own. Uh, you can't uh, conglomerate them and uh, you know combine them and uh, maybe have one that is a little too much exaction and another that's a little less of an exaction and have the two average out works out, that, that's the way it does. It's each exaction stands alone. And so the first part of the test is the essential link. Um, and this was created, or is, this is the Nolan part of the uh, test. If you're looking at the picture, um, the, the Nolans own the home that's marked by the uh, red arrow, or actually own the property. Uh, the home that's in the photo is the, is the new home that the Nolans built, the current home. Um, the, uh, they bought, purchased the property and it had a very small, it was a little, it was called a bungalow, it's probably a little more than a cabin. Um, and it was in pretty bad shape. And so, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Nolan bought this, uh, James Nolan, by the way, is an attorney. Uh, he purchased this property and said, you know, let's tear this old building down that's in bad shape and let's build a nice new home. Uh, the California Coastal Commission, uh, as the name implies, is responsible for development along the Pacific Coast. And you can see in the picture, um, the Nolan's home is right on uh, a public street or a public road, and their backyard is the Pacific Ocean. And they owned, uh, I believe the property line was, was the high water mark for the ocean. Um, and, and the homes along there, all along that, uh, that was privately owned up to the high water bar. Um, and anyway, in order to get development for this new home, they had to get permission from the Coastal Commission. And the Coastal Commission looked at it and said, well, you're, you're building a home that's going to block the view uh, of the ocean and the beach. Um, so what we want you to do is we want you to dedicate an easement across your property, the your the part of the Nolan's property was beach, 
uh, a 25 foot easement for the public. And uh, Nolan said, well, that doesn't sound uh, quite right. Um, but the uh, Coastal Commission, uh, they said, you know, what? Well, you're blocking the view. The, there was a small home on the lot, and you could see from the road out to the ocean. Um, you're blocking the view. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever uh, driven through Malibu. It's just north of Los Angeles. Um, uh, you drive along the road. It's, uh, it's called the Pacific Coast Highway. Uh, quite famous, but um, for several miles through the Malibu area, uh, you're driving on the Pacific Coast Highway, you can't see the Pacific Coast, uh, because what you see is a wall of buildings and homes, and then there's an occasional beach, uh, public beaches. Um, and that was actually what was driving the decision here, is that people were complaining, says, wait a minute, you're building homes and we can't see the ocean. Um, this wasn't Malibu, this was in uh, Ventura, which is about an hour north of Los Angeles. Um, but the, the Nolans objected to it, so like, wait a minute, if you want to preserve the view, why do we need to give you an easement uh, on the beach? Um, and they uh, pushed that. Uh, uh, the California Court of Appeals, uh, they cited on the side of the Coastal Commission, and the Nolans appealed that to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court looked at it and says, yeah, you know, you're right. Um, if the objective is to preserve the view from the front of the property, you're really not helping the view by requiring an easement across the rear of the property. Um, the, the commission's uh, logic was that it was, it was a psychological barrier to uh, public access to the beach, and that could only happen in California where you have a, a psychological barrier to a, you know, the, the beach, but nevertheless. Um, and what the Supreme Court held, and this came out the essential link, is that there has to be some sort of connection. Uh, the court used the term nexus, which is uh, the lawyer's way of saying connection, um, between the exaction and a legitimate government objective. So assuming that preserving the public's view uh, of the public beach in the ocean is a legitimate government objective. Um, how does an easement across the rear of a property promote the objective of preserving the view from the front of the property? And the court struck that down uh, as not being an essential link. So then we move on a few years later um, in 1994 to the Dolan case. This is Dolan versus the Steve Tiger. Uh, if you're looking at the photo, uh, this was the store. It was a hardware store owned by, I guess at the time it was Mrs. Dolan. Um, Mr. And Ms., uh, Mr. And Mrs. Dolan had built, it was actually a chain um, of uh, hardware stores throughout the Pacific Northwest. And I think Mr. Dolan had passed away at this time, and it was uh, Florence Dolan was the owner, and she was the plaintiff. Well, they wanted to uh, build this uh, hardware store. It's in uh, City of Tigard, uh, just outside of Portland. Um, and uh, in order to get approval, the city said, well, um, we have a couple problems. This property borders on a creek that is uh, important for uh, stormwater drainage. And so we wanted you to uh, uh, an easement along the creek, which would help with flood control. And the city says, you know, we also want to, we have public uh, traffic issues, and we want to promote bicycle. So we want you to dedicate a portion of the property along the front uh, to widen the road for a bike path. Uh, and the Dolan says, oh, yeah, come on, we're not, uh, how, how can we have to do that? We're, we're basically providing a public service. We're providing a bike path and a flood control. And the, uh, the court, first of all, said, well, okay, there's an essential link. They satisfied the Nolan test. Um, flood control and traffic control, those are legitimate interests. And uh, the easement along the creek, uh, which would, it would help with uh, the flood control, it would, um, it would, uh, what it would, the easement would not be uh, paved or developed. It would be kept in a natural state and that would help with uh, uh, controlling stormwater. Uh, it being Oregon, obviously it rains a lot. And then the uh, traffic control is also a legitimate interest and the court did, uh, make the note that um, 
providing for bicycle, you know, encouraging bicycle uh, use helps uh, with traffic control. But what the court pointed out was um, the amount of the property that is, the Dolans were asked to donate, um, did that, was that equivalent or was that proportionate to the impact that their store was causing? Um, and so that's where we get the roughly proportional test. And it must be roughly proportional in nature and extent to the impact that is uh, created or uh, attributed to the new development. So from the, rough, from the roughly proportional, um, we turn, and this was uh, just, to, well, it's been about in the last 10 years, there were three cases from the Utah Supreme Court from the same development. Uh, it was in the Magna area, it was on 35th South, um, and all three are uh, BAM, B-A-M, development versus Salt Lake County. And in those cases, the Utah Supreme Court uh, elaborated on the roughly proportionate test developed by the United States Supreme Court and adopted by the Utah legislature. Um, and in BAM, what, uh, what the developers in BAM were asked to do was uh, to develop some land or donate some land to widen the road. Um, the Supreme Court said, all right, or this is the Utah court said, we have two Supreme Courts here, we have to make sure we're saying the right one. The Utah Supreme Court said, all right, the test says that the exaction has to be roughly proportionate in nature and extent. And so they split those two up. And what they held was that a, an exaction is proportionate in nature if it solves a problem that was created by the impact. And so, for example, uh, example I'm giving is water. The problem is that the city or the county needs more water to provide service to the new development. So the problem is we need more water. Well, what would be the solution? Well, the solution would be that uh, we get more water rights. Um, and that's actually a fairly common, and there it is, the well coming up. Uh, that's actually fairly common, is that when uh, a new subdivision comes in, that uh, the city or sometimes the local district will say, all right, in order to serve this, we need water. We need, to, we need you to dedicate water rights. Um, and so that was, that's a proportionate nature because it solves a problem that was created by the new development. Um, to further elaborate on that, uh, this is, this is a, an advisory opinion that was issued by our office uh, a year or two ago, um, uh, where the city, uh, want, what they wanted to do was improve the appearance of their uh, arterial roads, the large roads that bring traffic into uh, you know, the residential areas. Um, and, uh, that's uh, certainly a legitimate, um, uh, it's a legitimate uh, concern, something they want to do. Uh, they were concerned, and, and maybe some of you have seen this or experienced in your own cities, is where uh, you have the road, uh, the houses don't front on the road, and so what they do is they build a fence. And so you have a fence right up to the sidewalk, and people are complaining, it's like, well, we're, you know, we're just going down a tunnel, you know, if the fence is on either side. Well, this city, they said, well, you know, that's right. Let's, uh, let's make something nice. And so they uh, proposed a rule. This is for new development, new subdivisions, that the lots that are on the, the arterial road, what they required is that uh, these, the developer had to dedicate an easement along the road and install landscaping. And so, well, then we have some landscaping that looks nice. Uh, sidewalk, you know, so it looks a little more pleasant than just a, you know, a vinyl fence. Um, they brought that question to our office and uh, we uh, prepared an advisory opinion on it. And where, where we stopped was uh, this question, proportionate in nature. Um, did the new development, did a new subdivision create the need for 
landscaping or did they create the need to make the, the streets look nicer? And our analysis, we said, you can't, it doesn't meet this proportionate nature. It doesn't solve a problem created by the impact. Uh, and the, the, what it came down to is the new subdivision does not create the problem. If, if the city wants to improve the appearance of its street, but certainly uh, a valid and certainly a, a laudable objective, um, but, but they can't put that burden on a new subdivision because the subdivision doesn't create the problem. Um, they can, for example, they could uh, have the, as part of the design or the development of a subdivision would take that into account. But uh, the city can't place that burden on a subdivision because it doesn't satisfy this portion of the test, the proportionate in nature. Um, so this is kind of where we get into the nitty gritty of uh, 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 exaction. The next half or the next phase is roughly proportional in extent. And uh, this is again the Utah Supreme Court. Uh, and what they said was proportionate in extent means that the cost of the exaction is roughly equal to the public expense to address the impact. So they, uh, in Utah Supreme Court, they reduced that to dollars and cents. Um, and uh, in the BAM case, or cases, uh, what the court find, uh, ultimately determined was that the cost of uh, the exaction that was required, which is a 13-foot strip of property, um, was actually quite low compared to the public expense that would be needed to address even the same impact from the BAM subdivision. Um, BAM subdivision actually wasn't that big. It wasn't a very large subdivision. But they said the cost, uh, the cost works out. Um, so the, the, the exaction in BAM uh, was upheld. Um, and again, this is a, another uh, advisory opinion that our office did. Uh, uh, this is a city. Um, uh, this new subdivision came in. It was about 25 units, 25 lots. Um, the access for this subdivision, uh, again, fairly small. They were fairly small lots. It was a very compact subdivision. Um, the access for this subdivision came in through one particular road in this city. And all of the utilities to serve this subdivision were tied into existing lines that were in the same road. Uh, and that, well, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. What the city required of the subdivision, however, was they wanted a new road built and new utilities installed within that road. Um, with um, under the uh, the logic that ultimately there would be other properties developed nearby and that would use that road and would use those utility lights, It'd be water and sewer and uh, uh, secondary water. Um, the uh, developers came to us, our office, and said, well, wait a minute, we have access from this existing road and we're tying into existing utility lines, which is serving our, our uh, subdivision just fine. Why do we have to build a new road? and install new utility lights. And it, we did the analysis and it came to this question is the proportional in extent. Um, the, they were actually, what they were, the city was asking this developer to do and put it in blunt terms was, they were asking him to pay extra. Um, they were asking him to build a road, uh, dedicate the land and build the road and install utility lines that actually would not be used. Um, for the time being, it, in all likelihood, there would be development in the future that would uh, pay for that. So this didn't, that uh, exaction did not meet this portion of the test that was not proportional in extent because the cost to the developer uh, exceeded the public expense that, to address the impact of that development. And that's important to remember, it's the expense of the uh, to address the impact of that development, not just the uh, expense in, in general. So that's the uh, rough proportionality analysis. Um, I guess I should, uh, if anyone had any questions, I guess I should have asked uh, if anyone was 
I, I haven't had any questions come in yet. I sent out, uh, if people want to type in the chat box, any questions they have, please go ahead and do that. You can use the Q&A box as well, but chat works really well, and I'll forward those on to, to Elliot if you, if you have those. This topic makes my head hurt a little bit. <laughs> I think it's quite, it's, uh, it's quite simple, really. I, uh, it all um, might be good. Well, we'll move on to uh, some other issues. Um, uh, in the, the Utah code, it allows uh, local districts may also impose exactions, and that includes uh, water districts, for example, uh, fire protection. That's why I put the fire hat. Um, and uh, a few others that would be within the jurisdiction of that district. Um, for example, a water district, they could uh, impose exactions related to water service but they really couldn't do an exaction say for parks because they don't do parks. Um, and the reason this is important, um, and uh, I don't know if any of the cities, the uh, people that are signed in now, but uh, I do know that there, there are some cities where uh, water service in particular uh, is provided by a separate district. Um, I said earlier, West Valley, uh, the second largest city in the state does not have a water department because water service is provided by uh, these other uh, public entities, these special districts. Um, and that's important because when new development comes in, obviously development needs water. And so um, we have a situation where the approval is being given by a city or a county, but the, a necessary component of the approval is we have these local districts and sometimes even other entities are involved in the approval process. Um, and uh, this question came up uh, a few years ago, uh, came to our office, where uh, the city was approving all the, uh, you know, all the development approval, but part of the approval was, a, it was a water company, uh, a water district, and they were providing uh, the irrigation water, secondary water. And in order for them to, uh, for, all, for their approval, they uh, assigned, uh, they required uh, construction of a new water line uh, to, for this, uh, the, this uh, new development was coming in. I think it was actually just one home. And uh, the homeowners kind of raised the objective to that. It's like, wait a minute, how come we're putting in, we're putting in this new line, you're, you're, you're making us put in this line that uh, will ultimately serve you know, several other homes. In fact, it would serve a whole neighborhood. And the uh, this water district uh, was a separate entity, and they said, "Well, uh, hey, we're not we're not covered by that law. That that exactions only are the responsibility of local governments." And the city saying, "Well, we can't approve this unless we get the approval of the water district bringing the secondary water in." They brought that to uh, our office. We did an opinion, and what we said, uh, the exaction rule applied to the local district, and it applied because exactions is a constitutional requirement. It, like I said earlier, that the uh, exaction derives from a uh, it derives from the the takings clause, the constitution. So because it's a constitutional requirement the water district should be subject to that same rule. And so uh, when local districts are involved in land use approval, uh, they have to comply with LUDMA. Um, that uh, provision of LUDMA, <coughs> excuse me, um, that LUDMA provision or, uh, brings local districts under LUDMA, basically. Um, that happened subsequent to that opinion. It was uh, in part because of it, uh, or it was inspired by it. Uh, there is a, a section of, it's in the local district uh, title of the code, which is 17B, title 17B. Um, what it says now is, when a local district is involved in the development approval process, they are subject to LUDMA the same way that a city or county would be. And that would include, uh, if they're requiring exactions. Um, and this would, now the, the next question is what if it's a private company? We, we've actually had that uh, just recently. Um, 
uh, gentleman came in, he was putting in a, a, a subdivision, and the property uh, that he was developing was crossed by a, an irrigation ditch, irrigation canal. The water company that owned the canal said, okay, fine, uh, you can build, build there, but you have, to, you have to put a pipe in. You have to pipe the entire uh, uh, ditch even beyond his property. They wanted it uh, piped all the way to the, um, I guess, uh, the main canal or the wherever, wherever the water went. Um, he came to us and said, wait a minute, uh, where does this water company get off telling me to pipe their irrigation ditch? Uh, his property wasn't even served by that water company. He didn't, didn't have any water rights. Um, the same sort of thing would apply, and again, because it's uh, the, uh, the problem we have here is that a water company is a private entity. Um, however, it is being tied in, it's brought in because it's an approval. It was part of the approval for the subdivision by the city, and so uh, certainly in implies that uh, the exaction rules should apply doesn't necessarily mean that it, it would. Um, we've been kind of talking about water as the, our example of exactions. Um, there are special rules for uh, water. Uh, number one, if a water, uh, for an exaction of water, it has to be based on the actual requirements. Um, and, and the second part is, you, a city or a county cannot impose an exaction if they have enough water to provide service to that development. So you, you can't basically bank, bank water rights uh, in the guise of uh, development approval. Um, this was, uh, was actually the first advisory opinion that I wrote uh, several years ago, um, which pretty much uh, followed this rule. Um, this was before, the advisory opinion was before this uh, uh, had been added to the uh, exaction statute. But it was uh, kind of the same thing, that um, when uh, you're imposing water interest, and really with any other exaction, it has to be tied to the impact of the development. Uh, we did this opinion, and uh, they were approving a new subdivision. And uh, the city, uh, in this case, they uh, what they wanted was a, a dedication of the water that had was uh, and the water that the amount of water they based it on was what was used to irrigate alfalfa. And looking at the numbers, uh, the amount of water you need to irrigate alfalfa is well above what is needed for uh, a home um, for the culinary use and even irrigating, uh, you know, landscaping or a lawn. And uh, so our opinion, uh, we held out and we said, look, under the exaction rules, the amount of the exaction has to be tied to the impact and you can't exceed that. Um, that uh, case or that, in that particular exact, uh, in that particular case, the city did not, didn't listen to our opinion and uh, it wound up in court and uh, the judge in that case, um, who had been the attorney, who had previously been the attorney um, that uh, helped draft that ordinance for the water exaction. Um, and even though he, he was still the judge, we can talk about that, but um, he basically agreed with uh, our position that the, the amount of water that can be exacted has to be only what's necessary to meet the impact. And that rule has now been added to the statute, uh, as you can see here. Okay, so what happens when uh, something goes wrong with an exaction and it has to be returned? Um, and in other words, you have a valid exaction, but you decide that you no longer need it. Well, statute provides that if the exaction is no longer used, it must be offered back to the original owner. Um, and that's only, it only is real, real estate. It only has to apply to land and it's only if the land becomes surplus uh, within 15 years of the exaction. So after 15 years, uh, the land belongs to uh, the public entity and they can do what they want. Um, notice that it says it doesn't have to be given back to the original owner, it only has to be offered uh, to the original owner um, because the, the owner might not want it. For example, it could be 
uh, for example, a road. Uh, I gave the example earlier of uh, the subdivision, and part of the approval was a land dedicating land for a road. Well, it might be you know 15 years from now, the owner, the the city would contact the owner and says, well, we're, we decided not to use the road. You can have this back. Well, the owner might not want a 33, you know, or a 50 foot strip of land, you know, in the middle of the city. It might not be particularly usable land. Anyway, um, so it just has to be offered. It doesn't have to be. Uh, uh, it doesn't have to be returned. It just has to be offered to the original owner um, at no additional charge. So in other words, the, what the law says is no additional compensation. Um, I doubt very much that that's going to happen a lot. Uh, again, number one, because uh, the original owner might not want the land back. And generally, uh, especially with real estate, with land dedications, um, they're, they're going to be used and they're intended to be used for roads or parks or whatever. And then uh, again, just to touch on impact fee requirements, uh, impact fees must be spent or used within six years. And if they're not, they have to be returned. So that's a special exception for impact fees. Um, so again, what happens when it goes wrong? What, what happens when the exaction is not, um, doesn't meet the rough proportionality analysis? Well, first of all, you can return it um, or modify it or pay for it. Um, basically, returning the exaction means that uh, uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't require the exaction anymore. Um, uh, you, in other words, uh, the American Fork situation, where you'd say, well, it's, it doesn't meet the rough proportionality. Uh, we're just not going to require you to dedicate that road for us anymore. So we cancel the exaction. Uh, the other, uh, another possibility is to modify the exaction. Um, uh, well, in other words, that the, the exaction would be reduced. Um, the uh, example I gave in the water, uh, where the where the city was requiring or demanding um, much uh, far much too far much more water than would be needed. Well, one approach they could do is say, "All right, we will lower the amount of water rights you need to dedicate, and have that tied to um, the, the only the water that's necessary or needed to serve your new subdivision." And then the final is uh, pay for the excess. Um, because an exaction is a type of taking, um, uh, anything that's over the fair share is a taking. And one option that uh, an agency would have is they could pay for it. Um, and one example of this, uh, some of you may have heard of pioneer agreements, um, where uh, a developer or usually it's the, the first the first person to develop in an area puts in the infrastructure. They'll put in the roads, they'll put the utility lines, et cetera. And with an agreement that future development would contribute uh, a share or a portion to pay for that infrastructure. Um, and there's nothing wrong with such an agreement, by the way, with they're actually uh, fairly common. The only caveat that uh, our office, and that, because we've uh, we've been asked this several times, the only caveat that we would add is that there has to be some guarantee or some promise that the original developer will be compensated at some point. Um, we, for example, a few years ago we had a, uh, the agreement provided that the developer pays for the infrastructure and other development coming in would contribute up to 10 years. And after 10 years, um, there isn't the obligation to pay. Well, the problem with that is if, if, I'm, uh, if I'm thinking about developing land and my obligation is I have to pay for, uh, you know, contribute for the infrastructure, then I look at the agreement and it says, well, it's only 10 years and we're in the ninth year, so there's, there's only a year left. Well, I'll just uh, sit on that land for another year, and then I don't have to pay. And the original developer is kind of on the hook. And so that's the caveat: is that it, there has to be some guarantee or some provision that the developer will be paid, and will, in, in other words, won't wind up donating uh, 
uh, an exorbitant amount of uh, property and uh, construction work uh, in exchange for development. Um, so those are the remedies that this is what happens when something goes wrong. And uh, in the materials, uh, in the, the outline that uh, I provided, uh, I've included, uh, first of all, the sections of the Utah Code, that's uh, 10-98508, uh, the county one is uh, 27-8507, and then the local district is 17-B-1120. Uh, I've included those statutes, and then also uh, just the information that the Impact Fees Act is um, Title 1136A. Um, didn't include the language, but there is a link to it. And then these are the important cases. Uh, we talked about uh, the Nolan Dolan and the BAM cases, and then uh, and, oh, and also the Coots uh, versus St. John's River. Um, the Coots case is important because it basically, it kind of ties up the last loose ends uh, for the exaction, uh, 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 the exaction issues. And it came out last year. Um, all of those statutes and those cases are available through uh, our office's website, uh, which is uh, propertyrights.utah.gov. Uh, if, uh, if you're so inclined to look them up and read them, uh, you're welcome to go to our website. Um, we do have a few minutes left, unless there's some questions. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions. Oh. Um, First question here, I'll read this one. There seems to be a conflict in fairness following the exaction process in distinguishing between new and old development. Example, if the city wants to have a bike path that crosses old and new development areas, it appears that they can require new developers provide bike path easement, but they must buy the same easement from older developments. How is this conflict in treatment addressed? Um, well, you're right, there is a conflict, but it, what it boils down to is the, the reason we have exactions um, is to help uh, the new development will pay for the increased need on public services. And so you have to look at it in terms of fairness, uh, and again, you can't impose an exaction on an existing development. Um, actually, a good example, um, I had a photo, I forgot to, uh, I forgot to put the include the photo uh, in the presentation. It's, uh, it's actually the photo of the BAM exaction. It's along 35th South. Um, it's, uh, I think the street is 7720 West. Um, that's the BAM subdivision. And for that portion of 35th South is uh, several feet wider than the rest of 35th South. <laughs> and um, that, that was the exaction that the BAM development had to contribute and that was uh, approved, of course, by the Utah Supreme Court. So, uh, and the justification for uh, that exaction, by the way, was that uh, Salt Lake County uh, pointed out that they will eventually will have to widen 35th South, um, and, and, and apparently they haven't done so except in that particular portion <laughs> where the BAM subdivision is. But uh, I don't know if that will happen in the future or not, but. That was the justification. So, um, in answer to your question, uh, maybe it isn't fair. I don't know because uh, if someone has, if they have an existing development um, that's along 35th South and they built their homes and relied on it, and then a new development comes in and the county decides, well, we're going to have to widen the road. Well, the new development would pay for that impact. Um, and in this case, it went through the analysis, and the the, uh, uh, the exaction was valid. It was actually a, a very low cost, uh, uh, even for, for that subdivision, for the extra width of the road. So um, uh, I don't know. Uh, there there are other alternatives, by the way, to exactions. Uh, for example, if you want the bike path, that could be it could be purchased, uh, you know, across the board. From, you know, along a road. So that would be one way to do it. Uh, if Salt Lake County is eventually going to widen 35th South, I'm, I'm guessing they're going to have to acquire property, you know, up and down the roadway uh, from several existing homes. So I, I, I'm assuming that's going to happen. Uh, so that would, one alternative would be to 
just purchase the property outright. Um, it could also be done, for example, through a special assessment area to uh, purchase, you know, additional, uh, to, to purchase that property. So exactions is one of the alternatives. Um, and uh, maybe you're right, it doesn't always fit uh, where you have one development, you'd have a bike path for a few feet and then you couldn't put the bike path for the rest of the street because that was existing development. So I, um, that's a decision that a uh, city or a county has to make on its own. Were there, were there any other questions? Uh, the other question was, uh, is there a way to get this PowerPoint? Uh, no, it's proprietary. No, of course not. Uh, we can, <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'll tell you what, I will uh, have that, make this available on uh, our website uh, and it will be under the training. Uh, at our website, along the top of the page, there's a, a link for training and I will include this PowerPoint and the outline uh, in uh, training materials. Great. That's it for the questions. Okay. Um, well, we're about out of time, but again, impact fees, the type of exaction, uh, but if you comply with the impact fees act, it satisfies rough proportionality. And so uh, that's the impact fees act is Title 11, Chapter 36A. And so uh, thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, you can always contact our office. We are happy to help. Um, questions about exactions or other types of development. And uh, appreciate the local government trust for uh, letting me do this and uh, talk your ear off for an hour. But um, anyway, thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Elliot. That's That was a great presentation. My head hurts far less now than it did to start with. <laughs> Hopefully I wrapped it around a little bit. That's that's great information and, and we hope that uh, uh, we hope that you'll you will take advantage of these webinars as we do them live. If you don't get them live, we record each one, place it on our website so you can go back and get this information. Say you've got a, a question about exactions, you can go back and watch this again and and, and get this good wisdom. But but really, but uh, but also uh, take advantage of the ombudsman's office. They they are there. Um, to help both local governments and and private property owners, um, to, so we settle these settle these potential conflicts uh, without without going to court and all of those things ahead of time. So, all right, thank you so much, Elliot. I appreciate that. We'll uh, we'll break now. Have a great day.